good afternoon. Uh, I am Elizabeth Kugel-Midlock, the director of music here at Rock Spring. I'd like to welcome you to Rock Spring and uh, to this wonderful afternoon of music. Uh, we're really excited to have this opportunity to hear this rarely heard but very powerful work. I would like to ask if you have any uh, cell phones or anything that might interrupt the performance, if you could put this on silence right now. Also, we have um, a basket in the back if you would like to contribute to our music program. We have a <coughs> series here. Uh, we would be most appreciative of any donations that come our way. I would like to, at this moment, uh, introduce your conductor, Mary Ann Potts. Well, thank you so much for coming out today and to Elizabeth and Rock Spring community for hosting us on this recital today. Um, I have many people to, to thank and I'm going to do that first because as you will hear, the unfolding of this work um, is rather complex and so to come on board with this kind of project is very, very um, special commitment. I would like to thank all of my singers, some of whom are my family, some of whom are my colleagues in the Arlington Public Schools, one is a fellow doctoral student at George Mason University. And then we have friends of friends who, who came along for the ride. Um, we also have um, people who are not present today who are, are very helpful to me, including my teacher, um, Dr. Stan Engelbretson. He is away on a tour. Um, Dr. Kate Hurden on our committee is one of my singers. And uh, Lisa Billingham, a member of my committee, not present today, also um, studied with her and our committee um, graduate program Dr. Bergman is our, our head of that and she's here today so I thank them for their guidance on this project. Uh, other people not present today but very important to this were the people involved in the permission to use this work and to translate it into the digital form that we use to rehearse. I would like to thank Belmont Publishers and um, in particular Ann Worth Schoenberg uh, for the opportunity to um, transform this music and to the archivist, uh, Teresa Muxenader at the Vienna uh, Schoenberg Center for furnishing with me many, many digital um, photographs and documents that were important in my work. And to the Make Music Company for providing uh, the software subscriptions for smart music, which we used in preparation of this project. So I mentioned that it's a, a complex work. How many in this audience are familiar with Schoenberg's De Profundis? All right, so you can see a few, um, a few of our uh, uh, members are familiar. Those of you who are not, um, it is one of his later works and one of his more complex works. And it is um, a challenge to sing in this style, as we'll hear, because it is an a cappella 12-tone work. 12-tone was the style of composition that Schoenberg developed, which took the chromatic scale and gave each note the same importance, as opposed to the diatonic scale, where we had tonic, subdominant, and dominant, that were the foundations or the pillars, and our ears began to hear those as accustomed places of rest, and um, we don't have the same kind of setup in this piece. Instead, we have something called a tone row, and I'm going to ask um, um, our accompanist, Diane Pellick, if she would play the tone row for this piece. <laughs> So the prime form of the row can be inverted and transposed to a different degree of the chromatic scale. And that's what we hear here. It's in its opposite shape. We have come to love those notes. But at first, we did not, which is perhaps why my committee um, has said, are you sure you have that many good friends that you can count on to sing this work with you? And I'm happy to say that, yes, the answer is I do, and you see them before you today. Uh, Schoenberg did begin composing in a tonal vocabulary in his first period of composition, but he soon um, moved beyond that to an expressionist kind of composition, which began to explore beyond tonality. His third um, period was the serial composition where it was very strict according to his rules of not repeating a tone within this until all the other tones had been heard. And then his final period, which we have today, where there was more flexibility given and he grouped in this composition into two different sets 
within that 12 tone scale, the first six notes and the second six notes. And within those two boxes, he could play around and repeat some tones with his authenticity still intact. So gradually he worked a little bit backwards toward the freedom um, that others rejected when he first came out with his serialist um, composition method. He even did some composing and tonality and parts of this tone row, the very end of his life, have a feeling of tonality as we go Tido in certain places in the music. You'll hear that, but it's not established with a set um, tonic that we are used to hearing. I would um, like to tell you just a bit about what we did with our technology to learn this. I transcribed our physical music into digital notation using Finale software, and then I sent it out to our singers as an assignment. We've only met in person four times. The rest of the time we've been working um, distance relationship through smart music. And if you look at Appendix A of your second handout, you'll see a page of music there where we have many different notes in lighter color and there are two that are darker colored. And those indicate mistakes that were made in this submission. And this singer did a very good job, only two mistakes on this passage. And then it not only says this was a wrong note, it says what the pitch should have been and whether it was in time with the rhythm or not. They listened to the sound of this accompaniment as they were singing. Schoenberg suggested that since it was so difficult, they could um, perhaps have the support of woodwind instruments, even in a performance. So I scored it with woodwind instruments. Now those strange thunks and other sounds that we heard were the uh, sound of the speech, which the computer couldn't really make. And so um, I, I created some percussion sounds for that. And that was our fabric to help get the ears wrapped around these different kinds of sounds. Schoenberg had a very vivid imagination. He was born in 1874, before any of this technology, of course, was invented. He grew up in, in a Jewish family in Vienna and just was very musical despite his parents not being musical at all. He taught himself violin and composition and he got together with friends and he did have one teacher by the name of Zimlinski that helped him with a little bit of the music theory. His um, Reception in the public was not so kind. They did not like this new um, kind of composition, and he spent most of his life trying to overcome that reputation of, oh, here comes Schoenberg. We really don't want to hear his music. Um, but we find that after repeated listening to it, in the way that they couldn't do back then without recordings, you really do become more accustomed to it. In addition to his work as a musician, he was also an author, and he wrote his own libretto to the um, opera Moses and Aaron. He wrote um, the play Der Biblische Weg, The Biblical Way, and he also wrote a political pamphlet, Four Points uh, of Jewry, and in this case, he was advocating a Jewish homeland in Africa. He was a strong Zionist throughout his life and was recognized by the nation of Israel in a couple of different ways. The first way is that he was um, asked to become the um, honorary head of the conservatory, the Israel Conservatory in Jerusalem, right before he died. Unfortunately, he was not able to take that position because of his poor health. He was asked to provide a selection for a particular anthology that was for the State of Israel called the Jewish Anthology of Music. And it was assembled by Chemio Vinever. And most of this volume is Vinever's collection of folk tunes from Eastern Europe. One piece is not, and that is Schoenberg's composition. It really stands out. The front of this is Marc Chagall. Marc Chagall was um, another Jewish um, painter like Schoenberg. Schoenberg also was a painter. And he thought of music in terms of color and blocks of sound, which you'll hear when we begin to put this together. So the psalm that was provided to um, Schoenberg to use as an example, Psalm 130, I, I'm now going to sing for you now in the way that Vinever collected it back in 1910 in Poland. Shira. 
So this psalm, very meaningful to the Jewish people. Psalm 130 recited um, as a psalm of prayer of forgiveness between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. A very, very um, weighty, beautiful transcription was sent to Schoenberg. And he looked at it and said, yes, I'll take the Hebrew from this. But he also said, I did profit from hearing the melodic fragments. And you couldn't expect me to write a primitive piece like this, so I wrote a 12-tone piece. And on first listen, we may say, well, really, there's not much connection between what he profited from and his composition, but I find that there is. I also find that there's a connection between that Psalm of 1910 and the one that a cantor friend of mine sang to me in 2014. And we said, wow, there are some pieces of this that are the same. And perhaps Schoenberg heard both of these psalms in his head. And here is the more contemporary version of that psalm. Shir hamalos mimama kim karasicho adonoi adonoi shima vakoli tiena oznecha kashuvos lekol tahanai ima vonos tishmoya adonoi And now I'm going to invite um, two family members to come forward. We'll be chanting in call and response style. Both of these chants would have been call and response, even though I performed them without stop, with the first phrase then being echoed by the congregation. But in this case, instead of having a direct echo, each of these singers will then respond with Schoenberg's response. And I hope that what you'll hear is that there are some similarities, both in rhythmic um, connections, especially the use of triplets, triplet, 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 and in the melodic contour of the, the phrasing. If you would like to follow along, this is Appendix D in your handout. It's on page four of the handout. Shir hamalvos mimamakim Adonai Shimon. 
In the next example, this is from the more contemporary psalm, from uh, Cherik's psalm, and it is a direct quotation. Even the notes um, that are present with the F sharp and the F naturals, but, and I find that fascinating. And so those are three examples of many more that are found in the packet of connections between the ancient psalms that were chanted and Schoenberg's interpretation of them. Thank you, Brian and McKenna. And so now that leads us to the choir. The first thing that we needed to do was to become acquainted with how these sounds work together. I mentioned that this was in Schoenberg's later style in which notes were combined in various combinations. They weren't necessarily in a row from 1 to 12. We might combine notes 1 and 4 together in one chord and 2 and 6 in another chord. And so we had to start hearing chromatically in a new way. So this is a warm-up that I devised to help us do that. And so in some of those notes, from one to the next, they have the same sound but appear differently as a sharp or a flat or as a natural called an enharmonic spelling. And that's a lot of the challenge visually looking at this music is to know that in a previous part, someone has been singing a C sharp while you see a D flat. So um, we had to get our eyes wrapped around it and our ears wrapped around this new vocabulary. Um, one of the singers said that using the smart music was a little bit like Rosetta Stone for 12 tone and to help us really get into this new language, and I think that that, that person was right. We heard the call and response concept between my chanting and McKenna and Brian. Um, the call and response was one of the features that Schoenberg consistently used in this piece. However, he used it in layers. Um, a lot like looking at a hologram in some ways. Many different layers that are all related to the same kernels of sound. And I'm going to invite you to turn in your um, handouts to Appendix E. And in that you will see that I have um, condensed the music to just two main lines most of the time. One voice singing followed up by another in that call and response pattern. But you will see that I've written Schoenberg dyad and Adonai dyad throughout the piece. Schoenberg um, put his initials in the song. E flat is S, and of course A is A. So sometimes it appears as Schoenberg Arnold, sometimes as Arnold Schoenberg. And throughout the work, we hear it in, is associated with the human condition, with sin, with supplication. And that interval sounds like this. And so true to form, Schoenberg picked an interval not usually used in tonality in, a, in such a heavy way, and that's called the tritone. It leaves you feeling a little unsettled, which I guess is the human condition when we think about it. At the end of this tone row, there were two pitches that um, occur throughout this work whenever um, we are singing about Adonai, or God, or holy attributes, mercy and forgiveness. And this is the sound of that dyad. a comforting sound to our modern ears. And so now we will let you hear a skeleton of this work with the call and responses in Schoenberg's tonal vocabulary of 12 tone.
So that is the sound of just the skeleton, one layer of the work. In addition to that, those thumps and percussion that we heard are actual speaking texts. Schoenberg was not the first to use this technique called Sprechgesang, which was a combination of speech and singing because it was moving the speech a little bit up and down in the voice. Some pieces like Perot, Lunaire, there was a real sense of melodic speech. In this case, it's more like the different sounds of um, prayers that would be murmured, different parts of the, the synagogue, perhaps um, uh, high voices here with the women, lower voices, raising your voice in supplication. So there's a sense of melodic inflection in the speech. And here's an example of a little bit of that Sprechgesang. So we layer that speech with the melodic patterns that we've heard. And now we understand the text connection if we look at it piece by piece. So I'm going to ask you to turn to page 13 in your actual program. And there you can see Psalm 130 in, a, in, in an English translation. So we'll connect a little bit with what we have been singing. In the first verse, there is melodic text painting meaning we're making a picture of ascending out of the depths. This was a psalm that was used um, for actual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Might have been sung on the, the temple steps. And each of their 15 psalms that are called Psalms of Ascent could be sung getting higher and higher in actual physical location at the Temple Mount. You will hear the exposition, exposition of the row, starting with Schoenberg's initials, and ending with the Adonai dyad.
In the second verse, the prayers ride up, rise upward in short triplet motives, triplet being a holy number um, uh, and in, often referred to as the Trinity in Christianity, but also a holy number in numer numerology, which was something that Schoenberg ascribed to. You will hear a sense of the leading tone as in doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, sounding as if it's trying to resolve and come home, and, and that supplication is heard here in verse 2. verse 3, we hear the word avanot, sins, and it is said in a more angular, dissonant melody with much larger leaps, sort of literally the ups and downs of stumbling through life. The Schoenberg dyad appears significantly here on the text, mi ya'amod, who could stand? Who could stand if you counted all of our sins? We would fall before you, God. And in this case, there's a falling down in the melody at the end of the verse with a dramatic retard where we cascade falling to our knees in the musical framework. In verse 4, we read about forgiveness. And here, Schoenberg is portraying a gentle sense of grace and forgiveness with a quiet or more tranquil setting of the text. You'll hear again the triplet rhythms, but this time they are repeated without stop in a sort of rocking sensation of comfort. And you also hear the text whispered quietly. And the use of major tonality coming through with major thirds giving us a sense of sort of 20th century security for those of us who like to hear the tonal sense of things. Now in verse 5, we have a sense of waiting for the Lord that comes through in a kind of musical impatience. Each voice enters in more rapid succession, making layers one on top of the other. So we're going to separate those layers out so that you can hear them a little bit better. And now we'll put that together for you.
And now in verse 6, we move from two voices competing with each other to three sets of calls and responses. The first set is on the text about watching for the morning and waiting to see um, what will be happening. And in biblical times, and even today in military situations, standing on watch means staying awake all night and being alert to what might happen, to see whether there might be an invasion at any particular moment or wild animals coming. And so we have, I imagine, around the gates of the village, three different watchmen who sound like this. The second set of watchmen or watch women. Third set. And now we have a, a symbolic sort of blowing of the ram's horn, which might have been um, what the watchman would have used if there had been some danger to rouse the community. Here we hear repeated notes um, that sound a little bit like a trumpet fanfare. We begin with the Adonai Dyad in the basses. And on that long held out high note is where we have the Adonai Dyad Shomrim watching over us. And now we hear the ladies do that. And now we combine that all for verse 6. In verse 7, we finally have the mention of the word Israel. And in the um, biblical sense, in the Psalms, this would be referring to the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, who in various times throughout history were either living in the homeland or in the diaspora. And in this case, I think we're sensing both elements. And Schoenberg was writing it after having fled Germany because of persecution with the rise of the Nazis. He had to leave his place of employment when um, his academy in, in Berlin said, we will no longer um, employ any professors of Jewish heritage. And even though he had converted to Christianity by the law, he still had Jewish blood. And so he did not wait for that year to end and finish his contract. He could sense the growing um, violence that was about to happen, and he fled to Paris. At that point in time, he reconverted to his Judaism of his roots, and then what came to the United States to live and make his um, um, living as a professor and a composer, mainly as a professor, moving from the East Coast in Ber uh, Washington, excuse me, in Boston and New York, moving west, finally settling in Los Angeles. And there he taught at the University of Southern California briefly, and then for a longer period at UCLA. During this time, he tried um, on several occasions to get members of his family admitted to the United States. Not all of them were able to come, and some of them perished in the Holocaust. And so at this point in time, I imagine that 
Schoenberg is writing not only about the Jewish people, but also about the nation of Israel, which has just become established um, in, in, in 20th century times as a refuge for Jewish people who have been persecuted in Germany and elsewhere to come and live. So here we will hear in its entirety how he has set a strong bass solo and a strong soprano solo as, as pillars of strength as he's saying, Israel, here we are, we are in a new land and we have new hope. And the other voices interject almost as the people are coming to this new land. And the final verse, verse 8, um, Schoenberg makes a change to a new time signature, to the time signature of 6-4. And so we continue this sense of triplet feel, but through the meter rather than through, through the individual notes necessarily that are performed. There's a climbing sense, finally reaching the pinnacle of the temple, finally reaching the pinnacle of freedom and safety. Um, and it was a building layer upon layer as the voices enter. We hear the Schoenberg dyad right at the very beginning of this verse. And he is reunited musically on the very last chord with the Schoenberg dyad and the Adonai dyad happening in this sort of explosive sound. Now this grand finale to the work originally um, in Schoenberg's mind was meant to change tempo but through the in unfortunate um, omission in the first publications and thereafter, with one exception, almost every recording has been performed at a slow tempo, sort of a hymn style, when Schoenberg's actual intention was to be more like a dramatic and triumphant march into um, Jerusalem. So we will perform it first in um, the slow tempo, a bit of it, and then we will give it to you in the faster tempo so you can see the difference. And now in the faster tempo. And so now that we have unpacked it verse by verse, layer by layer, we're going to perform it for you without stopping from the very beginning.
Thank you so very much. Um, 
Uh, one of our performers has to go catch a plane. That's one of my daughters, Kira, so she can just hop out right now. <laughs> you may have a seat. In addition to uh, Kira flying in from Ohio, we had um, Liz Eschen, a good friend, flying in from Boston. Thank you, Liz. So that's one of the reasons we didn't rehearse more in person, plus we're all very, very busy people. I think that what we've pulled together today in terms of singing a cappella, this difficult music that even Schoenberg himself said, you know, it's really hard, we should probably put some woodwind instruments with this to make sure it sounds all right. <laughs> I'm just very proud of their accomplishments and it's been a great pleasure to work with them. So at this point in time, I'll entertain any questions that you might have. Are there questions? Yes. You know, I'll have to go back and, and, and listen. I do not know for sure about that. Does that seem to you like perhaps they did? Okay, I will have to go check that out. That's a, that's a good question. In the back? Yes, ma'am. Why did you choose this? Well, thank you for that question. I actually intended to say that earlier in my presentation, but I was a little too nervous and I forgot. So Dr. Bergman is sitting here in the middle of um, this uh, congregation. She's a fabulous teacher and was teaching post-tonal theory, one of the courses I was taking. And we were assigned to write a paper on one piece. And honestly, I did not really like most post-tonal music. And I was thinking, perhaps I should just get practical and write it on a choral piece, because at least that will enhance my understanding of this in the choral world. And as I started working on it, I became just enchanted with um, Schoenberg's great um, devotion and thought that he put into it, and I came to really like it. So, uh, and the other reason is because I lived in Israel and I speak Hebrew. It was the language I felt I could um, communicate well with the singers and model the pronunciation appropriately, and it was therefore just of interest to me. Yes, Dr. Bergman. Um, this is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was um, influenced in the fact that I was listening to many, many recordings as I could in order to find, um, you know, what's being done. How are they, how are they performing it? Are, are they adhering to the score? And in the process, I discovered that there are only three recordings that actually have the, the, the tempo in the correct way at the end. And there's a misprint in one of the alto notes some people would say, who possibly could know? But I knew that from my 12-tone analysis that I did and parsing out all the numbers. So as I heard the recordings, I then would gravitate towards the ones that were most scholarly and in interpreting it with the correct um, tempo. Um, and I did not agree with all the Hebrew pronunciation of some of it. I consulted with uh, Joshua Jacobson, who's probably the foremost authority in the United States on Jewish choral music. And we discussed it a little bit. Um, it looked at the, the, uh, the sense of play and the vibrato in the voice and, and so I was most influenced by the things that I thought, well, I'll take this from that one, this from that one, and this from that one. I didn't model it after one particular recording. Are there other questions? How about from the singers? Any comments or questions from you all? Just a comment. The long distance uh, rehearsals that we did through smart music um, I'm not a polished singer as many are and Mary Hannah came and sat with me in a restaurant one afternoon and took me through this program through smart music and finale and it has greatly increased my ability in the music world. I highly recommend it. Thank you. David is one of um, several singers from the Chamber Crowd of Fredericksburg that I direct so They've made the trek up here. Um, I make the trek down there once a week, and um, I'm very grateful because they, they've come a long distance to participate as well. Anybody else? Dr. Herman? <laughs> um, I just want to say that it's been such a pleasure to be a part of your ensemble, and since I'm on the committee and I should report, <laughs> um, you know, you have to imagine that a great deal of score preparation 
in addition to the dissertation research you've been doing on this, a great deal of score preparation goes into a piece like this. And what you cannot appreciate in today's performance uh, is that you just have a glimpse from your program of the amount of work that Mary Hannah has done to prepare each rehearsal uh, and put this together in a really short amount of time. Uh, kudos to everyone singing today, but uh, really, uh, in spite of the difficulty of the score, Mary Hannah has been so um, generally agreeable and congenial and sweet to everyone um, and appreciative of, of our efforts and so on top of every rehearsal, and I really wanted to speak to that. You, You're terrific. Um, there comes a point when you start to wave your hands, but that's a very, very minor part <laughs> <laughs> in this particular piece. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Thank you so much. McKenna, my other daughter. And her other daughter. Um, my mom went back to school to get her doctorate as I was finishing up my undergraduate degrees, and I remember having conversations with her when I first started school, and she would say, now McKenna, you can finish this tomorrow. Just go to bed. It'll be okay. Uh, uh, and then about a year later, that switched. I was like, Mom, you can finish it tomorrow. You can go to bed. Um, so, one, um, it was really great to be here to sing with her on this. And the last time I performed it, I would say it was probably the time where I, I felt the most comfortable and felt like we actually were performing as, as an ensemble. So I don't know if that came across, but that was my experience the last time through. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Brian, uh, my future son-in-law, also <laughs> keeping it in the family. <laughs> um, I just want to say that, you know, despite this piece being very hard, it, like, we learned it, and I think, I don't know, the majority of us were not professional singers or anything like that, you know, and actually I think this piece kind of scared some professional singers that might have joined us. <laughs> I do yeah, think that I is true. Um, you know, like, I think it's, it's really interesting for me that even though this piece is so hard um, to sing and kind of harmonically grasp that, you know, kind of us average Joe singers can still, you know, perform. So. Thank you, Brian. I, I don't count you as an average Joe, however. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jim. I just wanted to echo the one thing that was already stated about the rehearsal preparation. Uh, you said this is the fourth time we've been together, aside from t tonight. Each rehearsal, we had a whole packet of rehearsal preparation material, new and different each time, and uh, to, to your rehearsal preparation, it made the time much more efficient. So, it was uh, Glad to hear it. Thanks, outstanding Jim. rehearsal preparation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, friends, thank you to all my performers, um, to Mike Connell and his video team, since not everyone could be present today, or we filmed this so that it can be viewed later, and to those of you who came out to support us. So thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful um, rest of the evening, and that should you choose to, share and to listen to this piece again, you take your packet and you choose one of the starred ones to listen to um, for the correct interpretation. And as a result of this work, um, Belmont Publishing will be issuing a list of errata, which I've discovered um, crediting my work, and hopefully um, issuing a new edition of the work that is correct. And I'm providing them with the digital files so that others could have the smart music experience as well. So thank you all very much and good night. <laughs>